Amen. Amen and amen. Pastor Caesar, welcome. Are you out there, sir? Amen. Finally get on. <laughs> yeah, God's doing great things, Pastor. He's doing great things. Mighty and tremendous things. Amen. Amen. I want to welcome all the listeners, all the followers to the Christian Talk Show with JK Woodall Ministries. This is episode number 10, Divine Order. 10 episodes in. What are you thinking, Pastor? I'm loving this. I am glad that people's lives are being touched, that people are receiving the word of God all over, and that God is being glorified. Amen. Amen, Pastor. Amen, Pastor. <clears throat> and I know that God is doing great things like you just said. Pastor, today is going to be no different than any other show. I know we're a day late for some of the followers out there, but we got a lot of things going on. God is just moving and using this ministry. What, what do you think? Yes, Pastor? he is. Yes, he is. Definitely. He's he's speaking just like he used to speak before and like he's always spoken. He's speaking very clearly. Uh, it, it appears that he's got uh, more to say now. It feels like than ever before, you know. <laughs> yes, sir. So praise God. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Praise the Most High. Pastor, why don't you go ahead and open this up? Yes. Father God in heaven, we just thank you for another evening that we are here, able to worship, to praise you, to glorify and honor your holy name, Father God. I pray that you prepare the heart of every listener, Father God, that you pierce any hardened heart, Father God. And we just pray that your work would go forward, your word would go forward, Father God, and that people would come to know you and know your holy blessed son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Father God, have your way tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen, Pastor. That's absolutely correct. Have your way, Heavenly Father. Have your way. Have your way. Amen. You know, you know Pastor, it's, it's all his. It's, it's nothing to do with us, huh, Pastor? That's right. That's right. Nothing to do with us. It's it's all him. It's uh, just like when the apostles, you know, uh, wrote the Bible. It's it's all inspired by God. Everything is his Holy Spirit. When his Holy Spirit is moving, I'll tell you, yeah, and nobody can resist uh, his his Holy Spirit, his goodness, his miracle working power. And it cannot be denied. Amen. Yes, it, that's absolutely correct. You know, the psalmist wrote, come see and taste how good God is. Isn't that right, Pastor? Amen. That's right. Come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. It's 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 amazing. It's amazing how how he's just using us to touch masses and thousands and people are just sharing this podcast, this talk show, and it's changing lives. You, you know, this this really brings us to our first topic. Because as as we get touched, as we get changed, you know, as Christians, um, we still go through things. And as yes. we go through these things, as we go through these winds or storms or what may have you mountain in front of you, obstacles. The question that we often ask ourselves, doesn't matter whether whether you're a one day Christian or, uh, you know, 50 year Christian. But do you know who you are? You, you ever you ever find yourself in a place, and, and Pastor, and you're and you're saying to yourself, "Who, who am I? Who, who, what's going on here?" Oh, absolutely! I'll tell you, and and it's not it's a very unsettling feeling. Uh, you you start to uh, doubt yourself at times, doubt your worth, doubt who you are in Christ. Uh, sometimes you can even start doubting God and the work that He's doing. And we can't see it when we're confused, you know, and confusion is of the enemy. Confusion is definitely not of God. So when we're going through these things, it's important to know who we are in Christ. Uh, because if we don't know who we are, someone will try to tell us who we are or who we should be. That, that could be the enemy himself putting things in our minds, putting doubts and fears in our mind, confusion. It could be a, a spouse. It could be a, a parent. It could even be a pastor. 
that's putting some some wrong thinking in people's minds. So you need to know who you are. And the only way to really know that is to be in his word. Amen. Because when you're in his word, his word tells you who you are. You know, and and I'd like to read a a couple of scriptures on this. Um, In Ephesians 5, 8, the Bible uh, speaks about it. It says, you are no longer darkness, but light in my son. Walk as children of the light. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, Another scripture, Matthew 5, 14 says, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill. And in 2 Peter 1, 3, it says, I have called you. In Revelation 17, 14, it says, I have chosen you. Right? So there's so many scriptures in, in Romans, in Acts, in Peter, in Timothy. You know, you are now a saint, a servant, a steward, and a soldier. Right? That's in Romans 1, 7. So you've got to know who you are are and that you are victorious through Jesus Christ. You have a glorious future through Jesus Christ. We are citizens of heaven. Amen. We are if 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 we serve a king, we belong to the king and he is our father, that makes us men a prince and women princesses. Amen. So we've we've got to know who we are, that we are ambassadors for Christ. We need to put our best foot forward, always be loving and and kind and and gentle and and truthful and honest and have integrity. All these things encompass who we are. But we can only be that if we have Christ in our lives and he is the center of our lives. Amen. Amen. You know, yeah, amen, Pastor. You know, I, I I tell you, when you forget who you are, it's almost like, uh, you know, you know, in America, some places get so cold, they, they, the lakes freeze, and that sometimes they're not totally frozen, so they call it thin ice. You know, you're out there, or you know, could be on a shaky ground or this thin ice when you forget who you yes. are. When I look, when I look at Galatians four. Verse seven, it says, therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And, and, and you know, you, you, you know, when you're looking at that, you're no longer a slave. So so slaves have limits. They're bound. Now, That's right. you could be a slave to addiction. You could be a slave to money. You can be a slave to other idols and obstacles, but when you come to Christ, you're no longer a slave. You don't serve man. You serve God. What what do you think? Right. Yes. The Bible says that he who the son sets free is free indeed. Free. Free indeed. So now I don't know uh, if many listeners know, but back in the day they had what was called bond slaves. Right. Bond slaves was when you were a slave and you loved and uh, uh, adored your master so much back in those days because there were what was, quote unquote, uh, very peaceful, very loving slave masters, even though the slavery may have been, you know, the issue. But they they really loved their their slaves. They were more like workers, so to speak, right? And when they were able to be released, a bond slave would say, I want to stay. I love my master. I want to continue serving this gentleman, right? We become bond slaves to Christ when we become born again. The Bible speaks about us being bond slaves. In other words, it's not now a slave by force, so to speak. And it's more a servant. I want to serve my God because he treats me so well. He loves me so much. You know, I want to be his forever and ever. 
I don't ever want to be let go from my my master, my Lord, my Savior, my Father, right? So there's a, quite a difference in that kind of slavery as a bond slave. Amen? Yeah, you know, Jesus, um, when he, he also added, Pastor, in, in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you, re if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. So, so that's who you are. If Jesus is the vine and we're the branches, we're an extension of Jesus Christ. What, what do you think about that? Absolutely. And if you cut off a branch from the vine, it dies. Mm -hmm. So you have to stay uh, connected to God in such a way that people will see the fruit that you're bearing and that it's good fruit. You ever been to a church where you walk in for the first time, you're a visitor and you walk in and you hear the worship and you hear the preaching and you see the, the, the pastor's heart and, and you see the, the people that, that greet you and, and everybody's so friendly and, and you just see the church is just huge. It's just growing and growing. And there's all these opportunities to serve. And you think to yourself, wow, there's a lot of fruit in this church. This is good ground. This is where I want to sit and serve. Amen. Because you know it's good ground. Why? Because they are worshiping, honoring God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when you get touched by that, when you feel that, when you experience that, listen, there's nothing like it in the world. It's, a, it's, it's an overwhelming love that you feel that is just incredible and and you hunger and you thirst for more and more and more you know i i remember going to some churches uh, when i was younger and i'll tell you inside of 30 40 minutes i was just like oh my gosh i want to get out of here the so it was just nothing but religion it wasn't relationship hmm. and i and i couldn't wait to get out i was i was bored inside of like i say 30 40 minutes, I, I thought, oh, how much longer do we have to go? And that was only a one-hour service. Mm -hmm. And then I remember I went to a church, my first born-again Christian experience. It was a three or three-and-a-half-hour uh, service. And I'm telling you, Minister Jermaine, I felt like it was 20 minutes. Wow. It just flew. I had no idea because I just enjoyed so much everything that was going on and how they were praising and worshiping God and speaking about God and preaching his word. It, it was a church that was alive. It was not a dead church. Amen. Yeah, no, you, you're right. The, the, the church is alive because God's alive. That's and, right. and, you know, and, and, you know, pastor, if we look at, and now we, well, we look at, we understand who we are. Why would the enemy want us to forget who we are. Because then he can infiltrate our, our field, our fruit, you know, like you put mm. uh, an apple or a peach or something. Right. And, and if you leave it out there too long and you're not, you're not putting it either if it belongs in the fridge or, you know, you you don't, you don't touch it for a long time and it starts to kind of rot. Then the enemy can come in and, in essence, place rottenness in your mind where you start uh, disliking people. You start hating on people. You start criticizing people. You start backbiting. You start rebelling against authority. You start to have a, a, a desire for the things of this world, alcohol, drugs, prostitution, whatever. You start to go back to those things. If the enemy can come in and confuse you, distract you, and tell you, you're not, you're not a holy man of God, or you're not a holy woman of God. Wow. You're not a child of God. No, that's that's all baloney. When's the last time God did something for you? When's the last time he helped you out of this or whatever? And you start 
entertaining those thoughts, mm-hmm. that's a mm-hmm. very dangerous place to be. Very dangerous place to be. Amen. Yeah, y- 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 you're right, because it, it gets you out there, and it almost feels like you're alone. Yes, huh, yes, yes, definitely, definitely. And and when you feel alone, I'll, I'll tell you, it's a mental, even a spiritual breakdown that feels ugly. You feel like you don't even want to live anymore. Wow. And that's why it's so important, not only that we know who we are, but the people you surround yourself with, your inner circle, so to speak, people okay. that can really talk to you. You know, I find something interesting in the movie uh, 300. I'm sure uh, many of our uh, people listening have seen that movie with, with Mel Gibson. And, you know, there's there's this part where this gentleman shows up with uh, thousands of soldiers or what have you. And uh, he says he sees Mel Gibson with only 300 warriors. And he's all like, you know, is that all the soldiers you brought? In, in essence, I'm paraphrasing here. He says, is that all the people you, you brought, you know, that, that, that you were going to bring more soldiers? And he points to one guy and he says, you. He says, what do you do? And the guy says, well, I'm a, I'm a blacksmith. How about you? And he says uh, something else. You know, this is my profession. And he turns to his men and he says, you know, who are you? And they just all start like, like they do in the military. Hoorah, 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 right? And they weren't thinking of what they were back home. They knew that they were soldiers and that that's what they were do. Uh, that's what they were there to do, to fight. And he tells the other gentleman that had the thousands of people, he says, you see, I did bring more soldiers than you did. See, they <laughs> knew who they were. <laughs> Amen. They knew who they were. And that's how that's how we have to be. And listen, the enemy has to know, hey, this is a soldier not to be messed with. Because this guy's got some heavy duty weapons. He's got he's got some armament here. And the armament is Christ. Amen. Oh, absolutely, absolutely correct. And you know, you, you bring up an interesting topic as well, Pastor. And it's a, a segue when you said you got to surround yourself by believers, by good people. Yes. Because the next topic is wise counsel. So what is wise counsel and why do we need it? It's, it's important that you surround yourself with sound people that have wise counsel. Let me give you an example. If, for example, I'm having trouble in my marriage, and if I go to somebody in the world, right, just to some, some let's say, friend of mine or what have you, and then he's not saved or what have you, and I seek his advice, I tell him my issues, and he might say, what are, you, what are you staying around with her for? There's there's thousands of women that you could be dating. Ah, you got to just divorce her, get rid of her, and, and move on with your life. That's not very wise counsel, right? If I go to a Christian friend of mine, a born-again, sanctified, set-apart Christian, and I tell him my tales of woe, I want to divorce my wife. This and that. First thing he's going to do is going to say, you know what? I, I understand how you feel. But listen, divorce is not the easy way out. It's not. First of all, God says he hates divorce. And listen, you are to die for your wife, for your family, for your children. You need to understand some of these things. Have you gone to seek help? Have you asked for forgiveness? Have you done all these things? See, they're going to start to give you wise counsel to, to slow your road, so to speak, so you don't do something stupid. Because then it's like, yeah, you divorced and you got, let's say, three kids. Now you're having to divide up birthdays 
and Christmases and uh, Father's Day and Mother's Day and maybe another uh, man or another woman comes into the picture and now your kids are calling that other man daddy and calling the other girl mommy and now you start to feel empty and alone and jealous and all these ugly things. Listen, divorce isn't the quick Oh, good way out. You know, if there's no cheating, there's no, you know, physical abuse. You you really need to focus on trying to seek God to restore your marriage. And that's what a wise man, wise woman, women of God, men of God will give you that right counsel. Amen. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, you surround yourself with people that are wise, like you just said, has has a, a slow to react, but quick to give you the word of God to stand on. You know, in Proverbs 11, verse 14, where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Amen. So having that wise counsel, Pastor, you, you know, go, go ahead and elaborate on because having that wise counsel is almost a key to victory. Absolutely. You know, in, in Proverbs 9, 10, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So see, fear of the Lord is the the beginning of wisdom. So if you, if you want to have any wisdom at all, you've got to fear God, his awesomeness, his, uh, his glory, his power, his strength, right? You've got to fear and know, wow, this is, this is an awesome God. And he is my father. You know, you have a, a respect for him. You honor him. Right. Also in uh, Psalms 111, verse 10, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Amen. So if you ask. For. Wisdom. The Bible says that God will give it to you. He'll give it to you. He will not hold it back. You need to you need to pray and ask for wisdom. You know, I remember when I was working at Warner Brother Records and uh, I was offered a, a very big position. Uh, I was going to be over 600 people. Uh, I was I was young. I was in my early 30s and. I remember feeling a little afraid, you know, like, oh, my gosh, this is a big position. I'm going to be in charge of every department, all the managers, supervisors, employees. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if I can do this. And the vice president of operations says, well, I believe in you and I think you can. I wouldn't be offering you the position if I didn't think you could carry it out. Well, I went home that day and I said, you know, give me, give me a chance to uh, uh, pray about it. He was a Christian man. And I said, give me, give me a few days to, to pray on it. And he says, sure, absolutely. I said, I'll talk to my wife and, you know, what have you. I went home and I started really, really pondering it. And I said, you know, I started praying. And I said, God, I said, listen. I said, if you're opening this door and you want me to walk through it, please, God, all I ask, give me the wisdom to guide your people. That's all I want. Just give me the wisdom of Solomon that I'll be able to guide your people because this is a big position. It's a very big responsibility. And I want to do right by you, God. I, as God is my witness, I was there and I was known. And this is not to give credit to me. Trust me on this. This is to give all glory and honor to God. I was known 
when I left that company after 20, almost 23 years, I was known as a man of wisdom. You believe that? Amen. <laughs> that's, that's what I was known for. Anybody that, it's like, hey, go to that guy. Oh, if you need help, listen, if you need advice, if you need counsel, if you need this, that, or the other, listen, that's the guy to go to. And I was so humbled by that because I felt like God had answered my prayer. Because honestly, when I took the position, I, I was like, oh, man, I feel like the biggest knucklehead in this plant. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I'm getting this opportunity. Why? Well, God wanted to do something. You know, it was God preparing me for what he wanted to do in my life. Amen. No, absolutely. God will give you that wisdom and, and also others will acknowledge it as you're using and listening to God, as you speak, you're not speaking on the behalf of yourself anymore. You're speaking on the behalf of God. And right. it brings us to our, su our subcategory, Pastor, worldly counsel. You know, listening to folks in the world that you were alluding to earlier, and I look here in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. That's right. So, so although you may have, you, you're going to church, you're serving, you listen to gospel music, you're glorifying God. What happens when this evil counsel creeps up? Listen, when evil counsel creeps up and starts getting in your head, that's what makes you fall. That's that's how Eve fell. She was listening to wrong counsel. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? The serpent was speaking. And instead of stopping and saying, no, this is what God said, and knowing it, I mean, because they had they'd heard it straight from God's mouth, right? Not to, not to eat this fruit from this tree. But when the enemy, that wrong counsel starts getting to you, did God really say that? I mean, well, this is really the reason why he's saying that, mm -hmm. Come on, you know, and starts to give you that bad advice, start telling you, Listen, you got upset with your wife or your husband. You don't, listen, just go out and party. This, man, let's just go out and drink, right? And you listen to this wrong counsel, this bad advice. So you go out and you say, well, I'm just going to have a couple of drinks with the girls or the man. Uh, I'm just, I'm just going to go out with the boys tonight because I'm upset or because I'm depressed or because I'm hurting or whatever. And you're not surrounding yourself with good counsel, but worldly counsel. That can change your entire life. Your entire life in one blink of an eye. You go out with your friends. You start drinking. You're having a good time. Before you know it, you're driving home. You're drunk. You hit another car. You kill somebody. And your life changes forever. In one failed swoop, the enemy steals your freedom, steals somebody else's life, or even maybe your life, right? Now, all of a sudden, your children are affected. Your spouse is affected. Many of your loved ones, your friends, your parents, people get affected by one wrong counsel and you listening to that bad advice and you taking it and applying that advice instead of the godly advice to your life and it can change in a heartbeat not something you planned not something you wanted but yet something that happened because of a wrong acquaintance bad advice bad counsel wouldn't you say no, you're absolutely right. You need to be, and, and that's why, you know, we start off with, with the wise counsel. Because once you surround yourself with that wise counsel, those words of God to be spoken to you, and they're supposed to come back in remembrance. So when you get off course, when people are asking you to get off course from that, that unwise or ungodly counsel, you can recognize the difference. You no, know, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. 
So you know that when it's not coming from God, it's not coming from the Holy Spirit, you should be able to recognize that because of that wisdom that you spoke about, Pastor. But what happens, Pastor, when you when you when you're getting or when you receive some ungodly counsel and you have nowhere to go? What 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 do the Christians do? What are the listeners supposed to do? Listen, you get into prayer and you start reading your word. Because God himself will counsel you. He's the great counselor. Yes, right. Amen. You, go. you can't go wrong with whatever counsel God gives you. I remember once, uh, and I was I was young. I was probably 16. And I was working for a swimming pool company, cleaning pools and what have you. And I had saved up uh, some money. You know, let's little money, but back in the day, you know, back in the seventies, I mean, it was a lot of money. It was $170. And I had worked very hard to, to save that money, you know? And, uh, I helped a friend of mine out. Uh, he had gotten into some, some trouble at his home. His, his parents were kind of abusive and what have you. And he came to stay with us. And, um, one day I came home and I found out that the money was missing and he had left our house. And I got word through another friend of mine that he was spending big money. Well, he, he didn't work. He was staying in our house and he was spending, you know, big money buying everybody pizza and donuts and ice creams and all this kind of stuff. Right. And I remember being very hurt and very angry. And I thought I was barely starting to come into the things of God, you know. And um, I remember thinking, well, you know, I had some kind of, you know, old gang member friends and I had belonged to a gang. And I'm like, you know what, I'm going to go, you know, get this guy, right? Force him to get that money back to me. And I remember some friends came to my house and they, hey, you know, if, if you want Caesar, we'll, we'll go out there and, you know, we'll pull him out of his house and we'll break his arms. And, you know, I mean, you know, there were some bad guys. And I remember saying, just just having that little bit of pause and saying, you know, let, let, let me think about it. Oh, we'll go right now. Let, let me think about it. All right. And I started asking God. I got on my knees and I started praying. And I said, okay, God, look, this is my money. It's rightfully mine, right? I should be able to go take it and just get my money back. It's owed to me. And I worked hard for it. You gave this to me. So you tell me, should I do this or not? Because I'll go right now. And... I opened up the Bible to begin to read. And it, man, this is a true story, Minister Jermaine. Mm -hmm. I opened up right to the verse that said, listen, if a man asks you to carry something, don't go one mile, go two. Right. If a man asks for something, listen, give him, give him your shirt off your back. Give to anyone who asks of you. It was all there. Right. Like, listen, this is no, you're supposed to give. You're supposed to help. You're supposed to, you know, not take vengeance. Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. So when I read these things. My friends came back later that night. It's seven, eight o'clock in the in the evening. They said, "Hey, are are you ready?" And they had they had chains, bats, and stuff. They were ready to go. And I said, "No." I said, "Let them keep it. Don't don't worry about it." No, but that's your money, Caesar. And I said, "Listen, I'm telling you, leave them alone. Okay, just leave them alone. Don't do anything. Right." So I knew. See, that was wise counsel that God had himself had given me because I didn't have a whole lot of Christian friends. 
right? I was barely starting to come into the things of God. You know, I still wasn't thinking completely straight, but but I had at least some knowledge of who God was. And I read his word and he gave me the wise counsel. Could you imagine had we gone over there, gotten this guy out of his house, maybe taken him to some other house to beat him, right? My friends who were trying to quote unquote protect me when I should have been like Jesus, you know, get thee behind me, Satan, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. a, a wrong hit, a bat to the head guy dies, I ended up in prison for the rest of my life, right? Or they they hurt him. Maybe he doesn't die. They break his arms. Now my parents get sued, you know, for the hospital bills. And I still end up uh, in jail for kidnapping because he took him out of his house and took him to another place. You see, that, that's what I mean. It's like, listen, if you don't have anybody around you, you need to go to God. You need to go to his word because he'll save you from yourself and the stupid decisions that we might make that could cost us our very lives, right? We show up. How do I know? He's, he's a young kid involved in gangs as well or what have you. He pulls out a gun and shoots two or three of us dead. So you have to, if you don't have uh, good Christian friends around you, solid people, listen, then you got to go to God. You have to go to God and you have to stick with what God says. Amen. And he'll guide you. He'll guide you. He'll give you uh, wisdom. You ask him. He'll give you wisdom and he'll let you know what the right thing to do is. The thing is, once he speaks to you, you need to listen. And you need to do what he's telling you to do because it doesn't do any good, as the Bible says, uh, you know, to be hearers of the word and not applying it. You have to apply. Right. If no, you're changing it, it, your 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 car tire, it, it doesn't do you any good if they say, OK, well, look, you're supposed to tighten up all these bolts and you say, oh, OK, great, great information. Thanks. And you don't do it. Guess what's going to happen when you start rolling on the freeway? <laughs> you know, down the off. block. <laughs> exactly. And you're going to be in a, a whole lot more trouble, right? Because if that tire flies and hits somebody or hits another car, it's like, oh, man, now we're talking a lot of money and insurance and, uh, you know. So you have to apply God's word. And when God tells you to do something, you have to be very quick to listen. Amen. No, absolutely right. So if if, you know. Christians find themselves by themselves, or even if they're they're new as a believer and they find themselves by themselves, they need to go to God, pray like you said, seek seek the word like you did, Pastor, and just unfold it to you. You know, as, as I look Amen. here in Isaiah, Isaiah 9, verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, Shh. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen. Isn't that that's a that's a good word? Amen. Absolutely, absolutely. So He's already given to us. A child is born, and the Son was given to us for counseling. So that's we right. just need to seek Him. What do you think about that, Pastor? That's right. We need to seek Him daily. Daily, because daily we're making decisions. Daily we're, we're uh, you know, doing actions, right? So we need to seek him daily from the moment we wake up. You know, um, a lot of people, first thing they do when they open their eyes, they stretch and they yawn and they're like, oh, you know, feeling good about the morning. And the first thing they reach over is, oh, let me check out Facebook. Let me look how, let me see how many likes I got on this comment. Right, let me see all these stories on TikTok or let me check out my Instagram account. Instead of thanking God 
that he gave you your very next breath. Amen. Right. That you pray so that you prepare your day. You worship him. You glorify him. You thank him. You honor him. Then you can do whatever else you, you need to do. But when the first thing is you grab your phone, well, listen, that's a problem. Could could be your next title. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Amen. You know, you know, when you when you talk about, you know, folks waking up and just grabbing that phone right away without giving reverence and and thanks to God, you know, thanks for protecting us through the night. Thank you for just blessing us. You know, new believers, sometimes they get that prayer, that that seeking, that motivation, that angst. They get it kind of mixed up. And yes. our, our last topic was new believer misappropriated zeal. So what are you supposed to do with all this stored up energy, Pastor, as a new believer? How do they expel it? What are you supposed to point the energy towards? You know... The primary uh, reason for a believer is to worship and praise God. That's number one, right? To love God with all your heart, all your strength. This is what we need to do first, right? And we need to seek him. We need to know who our God is. For a new believer, that's important. You need to know who your God is and then know what he says about you and about who you are, right? Because one of the fundamental mistakes I think that new believers make is because they have this misappropriated zeal, they want to go out, you know, like they say, like the rookie cop wants to go out and save the world. And that's, that's a great goal, but you've got to be prepared for the world, which you're throwing, thrown at, Right just like a, a police officer has to go through training. I mean, we as new believers have to go through training. I'll, I'll tell you a story, and this is a true story that that, that, that happened uh, when I was uh, back in the day working and uh, my spiritual father, my pastor was, was going, we were working together at the same place. And uh, this new believer, um, that we knew he came into my office and, you know, pastor was there and um, he was just so on fire for the things of God. Just, he had a hunger and a thirst and he, he devoured the word and, and just, just was on fire Had a, a real zeal for the Lord and the things of God. And he came into the office and he told us that he wanted to go back. This, this was a gentleman who had been in prison, got out, was on parole um, he, he came from, you know, the, the barrio, as we say, you know, the, the gang uh, neighborhood mentality and what have you. And, uh, he had given his life to the Lord and he had only been saved about three months. <clears throat> and he said, I want to go back and preach to my homeboys. I want to go back and get them saved and talk to them about God and what have you. And pastor and myself were saying, listen, we, uh, we don't think that's a good idea. I mean, you're very new in the faith and uh, your, your zeal and your hunger is great and it's appropriate, you know. However, you need to be careful because if you go back, you're trying to pull them up, but they may pull you down. So you've got to be careful. No, I think I'm strong enough. I, you know, I, I don't do drugs anymore. I don't do this. I don't gangbang. I don't. It's like, listen, listen, I, your heart's in the right place, definitely in the right place. But listen, why don't, why don't you at least safeguard yourself? Take some of the brothers, the Christian brothers with you, you know, because that way, at least if you go there and, and they start to try to kind of pull you in, your brothers can kind of hold on to you and pull you back into the things of God, right? They, they can be there to counsel you and, and like, okay, no, no, this guy, this, or this is happening. You know, we better just leave or whatever it is. Well, he didn't listen. We got a call the next day and he was calling 
crying, just crying and crying and crying. And pastor's like, what, what's going on? What's, what's going on, you know? And he says, I should have listened, pastor. I should have listened. And he says, well, what happened? He says, well, I'm in jail. He says, and they're giving me five years. And it's like, what? What happened? Well, he went over there to talk to his quote-unquote homeboys about the things of God. And they were acting like they were receiving it. And, hey, can you give give us a ride to this other homeboy's house? And he says, yeah, sure. They all got in his car and they got pulled over. Well, all his homeboys were riding dirty. They had guns and they had drugs in the car. He did not know this, but they were caring. But because... They had been on probation, parole, and had weapons and drugs and stuff. He could not be allowed to be with them. He, he shouldn't have even been hanging with them. And he got put in jail for five years. So that new believer zeal can be dangerous if you don't know how to use what God has given you yet. So your job as a new believer is, yes, to preach the gospel to people, to minister, but to receive and receive and get into the word and study it and learn it, memorize scripture, do these things. Then you can go out and try to help others. See, you've got to be careful. You can't just go lay hands on all kinds of people to pray. You know, spirits jump. And you, you, you don't want to be doing that. You don't want to be going where you can be dragged down or like an alcoholic. And, well, I want to go help the alcoholics in, in a bar. And now you end up getting drunk with all of them instead and get yourself pulled over and there's a DUI or, you, like I say, you crash or whatever. It's You have to be careful as a new believer. You have to trust those that are that are guiding you, and you have to trust God and what he's telling you to do. And how can you do that if you haven't been trained yet? If you haven't been trained and you're going out to try to save the world, so to speak, right? I mean, look at the apostles. You know, they were walking with Jesus daily, daily walking with the Lord. And the Lord was constantly speaking in parables and then telling them, this is what the parable means. See, they had training. They had wise counsel. Right. They knew what they what they had to do. But you don't want to be like those people that heard about uh, Jesus and then go out to try to cast out these demons. And the demons came out because they're, they'll listen to authority. They'll listen to Jesus. But they came out and they said, well, Paul we know. Jesus we know. But who are you? Because they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. They didn't know Jesus. They had heard of him. They said, yeah, we cast you out in the name of this Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Right? So you have to be careful as a new believer with whatever zeal you have. It cannot be misappropriated. It's got to be done right. You and I have talked about this before. Um, you don't give the car keys to a five-year-old because if you do, what's going to happen? Now, you may, you know, want to give your kid everything in the world and uh, this is your car and I'm going to save it for you. But you can't hand over those keys until they know how to drive because it's dangerous. Same thing with the new believer. You've got to be careful because there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. I've known of people that were saying that they were prophets or what have you. And then uh, going up to new believers because they know that they don't know any better and saying, you know, well, God told me that you're supposed to give me your car. 
Oh. And because they're, they're because they're new believers and they're they they love the Lord and they feel, oh, this is a word of God. They'll hand over the keys and the pink slip. Meanwhile, they're getting ripped off. So that's why I say you got to be careful. No, you're, you're you're absolutely right. You know, just to reference that scripture, Pastor, about um, you know uh, other folks trying to cast out demons that don't know, really know Jesus that well. That that's in the Acts. Uh, chapter 19, starting at verse 11. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the, by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the disease left them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then some of the inherent Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exercise you by the, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief high priest who did so and the evil spirits answered answered and said jesus i know and paul i know but who are you <laughs> isn't that something faster uh, yeah and we keep reading what happened to them you know yeah they got yeah, they, they got were, their clothes ripped off of them <laughs> that's know? right they were beat up and you beat know set, set naked running through the street yeah. <laughs> So it's like, yeah, you've got to be careful. You've got to know, again, uh, what, you know, <laughs> what sir. you're dealing with, who you're dealing with. And, and if you don't know, like, see, they didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. If you don't know, it's a problem. It's a problem. And, and you certainly don't want to get yourself into trouble trying to go and cast out demons in the name of Jesus because you're, you're excited. You're a new believer, and you're like, oh, my gosh, I got the power, and I got this. And it's like, oh, okay, hold on, grasshopper. <laughs> you know, let's, let's, let's get That's trained right. a little bit. You know, a boxer, just because he becomes a boxer, doesn't become a world champion overnight. He's got to be trained. Hey, this is how you duck. This is you got to get conditioned, jump rope, and and listen. This is how you hit the speed bag, and this is how you avoid, and this is how you step into the punch. This is how you back off. This is you know you've got to learn all this stuff before you get out in the, into the ring. Because listen, we have uh, an adversary, an opponent that you know uh, we are not to take lightly. You know. He's not more powerful than God, but he is powerful. So we we need to be careful, definitely. No, absolutely. You know, that zeal, that great energy or enthusiasm that people have, would you say the new believers or even believers that's been around for a while, taking that zeal and just seeking the face of the word of God? What, what, what do you, what, what? I'm sorry? The, the believers that have this zeal or this enthusiasm, would you say that they should just, you know, how should they use it? How should they expend it? Seeking the word of God and just learning more about Jesus. Yes, absolutely. You, you, you've got to study, just like you study an adversary to know their, their weapons and how they attack you and, and, you know, uh, how they, they manipulate or how they, they try to come at you. Listen, you've got to learn who your father is and who your savior is, who the Holy Spirit is and what they say about you, what they say about your life, how they, how they say you should act and how you should think and how you should feel. You need to be able to understand and know and have that relationship with your father. Amen. You, you need to know that it's, it's kind of like I tell uh, people sometimes, you know, I say, well, you know, who's, who's one of the, you know, great uh, players in, in the NBA, you know, and invariably, you know, they'll, they'll name, you know, whoever, whatever player they like. And I'll say, okay, do you know their their jersey number? And, oh, yeah, he's number 34 or he's number 28 or whatever it is. And then I'll say, okay, if you saw him in the street, would you recognize him? Oh, psh, absolutely. Definitely. No, there'd be no confusion. It's like, 
would he recognize you? And I'm like, well, no. It's like, why? It's because you don't have a relationship with this individual. You know about them, but do they know about you? Now, God knows exactly who we are, right? And we know who he is. Everybody's heard of God. But not everybody has a relationship. Even some people that think that they do. Because when they say, oh, in your name we cast out demons. In your name we did this. In your name we did that. And what does the Bible say that the Lord is going to say? Away from me, you evildoers. I never knew you. So we need to know who our God is. We need to have a relationship with him. We need to know what he's done, uh, what he's about, what, what he wants us to do, how he wants us to serve him, right? And when you give your life openly and completely to God, then he can use you as an instrument. Right? He can use you as a powerful instrument to affect other people's lives. As they go through their daily struggles, God may use you to help them so that they don't commit suicide, so that they don't go back to drugs or back to drinking or back to the world. God may use you to encourage them when they lost their job. God can use you to, to heal, to lay hands, pour oil on somebody and, and use you. It's his healing power, but he uses you as his vessel. So the more you know about God, the better off you're going to be. Amen. Amen, pastor. Amen. And pastor, that's the hour. You're kidding. God is so good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That didn't feel you know, like it, did it? <laughs> it? It sure didn't. It sure didn't. You know, God is just Amen. moving, especially when you talk about you know, his goodness and, and you get the word out to his children. The time just goes so fast. Amen. Amen. Pastor, any closing, any closing, any closing statements for the, uh, for the audience today? Get to know who you are. Get to know who God says you are and get to know who your God is. Amen. That's it, Pastor. You got it. That is it. Absolutely. Amen. That was a powerful hour. And I know that people's lives are going to be changed by just listening to the word tonight. Amen. That's our hope and that's our prayer. That's right. That's right. I'm going to go ahead and pray this out, Pastor. Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again. We praise your holy name for all that you've done and all that you're doing, allowing the message to come through us and reach your children, blessing your children and giving them your instructions. Continue to bless them, Lord, and uplift them, anoint them, and allow any don't allow any hurt, harm, or danger to come to your children. Just bless them and protect them. Love them and lift them up. These and all things we ask for in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen, amen. Pastor. Amen, amen, Pastor. Well, I'll tell you, God, is good. God is so good, Pastor. And like we always say, we, we love each and every one of you. We want God to continue to bless all of you. Pass this podcast on to three or more individuals so they can be blessed as well. Tune in every weekend for our show. Go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell so you know that we're going live. And I want each and every one of you to stay blessed, stay safe. And remember, you, you have the power. The power. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.